Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. Let's begin by taking up a column from page number 6 that has been written by M.K. Narayanan, who was India's former national security advisor. In this column, the writer is talking about a post-COVID-19 world in which we are going to witness significant changes in the global order. Basically, he is talking about the role of the pandemic in turning the current world order upside down, leading to the establishment of a new world order. Mr. Narayanan breaks up his analysis into four parts. First, he talks about the economic consequences of the pandemic. Then he talks about the political consequences. And he also talks about the social consequences and the rise of digital authoritarianism. First, let us take a look at the impact of the pandemic on the global economic order. See, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused a lot of volatility and uncertainty in the global economy, primarily because of two reasons. One, its potential to cause an exponential increase in the number of new cases and deaths. And two, we do not have a cure or a vaccine in sight. So this volatility and uncertainty caused by the pandemic has more or less permanently upset the global economic order. See, amongst all the countries that have been affected, China is the only country which has some experience of dealing with an infectious disease on this scale. While combating the SARS epidemic of 2002-2003, China gained valuable expertise and it has made use of this in its fight against COVID-19 as well. Despite its initial mistakes in the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, China has more or less managed to contain its spread. But despite controlling the occurrence of new cases and deaths, the Chinese economy is going to be affected in the long term. Especially China's manufacturing sector and its exports have taken a massive hit and it might take years for China to recover from this impact. China being the world's biggest exporter of manufactured goods, this disruption is going to have a cascading effect on the global economy. Almost every country including India and the United States, are heavily dependent on Chinese exports. And there is simply no other country which could take China's place as far as the export of manufactured goods is concerned. So this disruption in Chinese exports is going to significantly affect the global supply chains. And this is bound to affect the economy of almost every country in the world. The writer says that the timing of this disruption to the global economy is highly unfortunate because we were already witnessing a lot of uncertainty in the global economic and political environment. We have seen over the last one year how major economies around the world have decelerated. Then upon this, we have witnessed an increase in geopolitical tensions and trade wars. In addition to this existing uncertainty, if you add the massive and unimaginable disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, we can easily conclude that the global economic order is going to be disrupted forever. Only time will tell as to how the global economy is going to evolve during this uncertain period. And for countries such as India, a massive challenge lies ahead of them. The Confederation of Indian Industry has estimated that the current lockdown is going to cost India around $120 billion, which is around 4% of India's GDP. These losses are only going to increase further as the pandemic spreads across India. Growth estimates from World Bank, IMF and investment banking firms such as Morgan Stanley have pegged India's growth at just 1% to 2.5%, which happens to be a historic low for India in the recent past. Prior to the pandemic, India's financial and banking sector was already under severe stress and this is bound to increase further as a number of businesses will find it difficult to continue their operations. So in short, from China to India, from United States to Europe, there is going to be economic turmoil due to the pandemic. And in a post COVID-19 world, we are going to witness the emergence of a new economic world order. Now let us talk about the political consequences. Since it is a given that we are headed towards a global recession, most private businesses would need to be supported through government funds and this is going to push most governments 
to breach their fiscal deficit targets and this in turn is going to have severe political consequences. The weakening financial position of a government is going to affect its stability and we are already witnessing this in the United States. The United States is no longer the dominant power that it once was and it is clearly retreating from every sphere of influence be it strategic, be it economic, be it military. And this vacuum created by the retreat of the United States is being filled by countries such as China and Russia. The writer argues that this change in balance of power marks the retreat of the liberal world order and the rise of authoritarianism. Despite the impact of the pandemic, China will continue to remain a dominant economic power and it will continue to exercise its strategic influence across the Asia-Pacific region and beyond. Then Russia, under the leadership of Putin, has managed to achieve a lot of political stability and as a result, it is able to extend its strategic influence across Europe, West Asia and as well as across Central Asia. So this growing stature of China and Russia accompanied with the retreat of the United States could very well mark the beginning of the end of the liberal world order. Now let us talk about the social consequences of the pandemic and understand how the social world order has been turned upside down by the pandemic. See the long periods of isolation caused by the enforcement of social distancing measures is bound to have a significant impact on the mental health of an individual. We have already seen a significant increase in the number of suicides around the world and governments will be left to deal with thousands of individuals who are more depressed, angry and addicted to substances such as alcohol, drugs, etc. So these social changes can cause erratic changes in a person's behavior and this will directly translate into a law and order problem. Then on the other hand, the pandemic is already increasing the divide and inequalities in the society. The economic downturn is going to lead to job losses in both the formal and the informal sector. So rising unemployment accompanied with the suffering of migrant workers and the rising cost of health care is going to affect the lower and the weaker sections of the society the most. Such widespread inequalities will not only affect the well-being of the weaker sections but it can also translate into a law and order problem which could affect political stability. Now let us understand how the pandemic could promote digital authoritarianism in the future. See China which was the first country to witness the outbreak started to deploy a variety of technologies driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to contain and control the spread of the pandemic. These technologies were primarily used for better surveillance and for monitoring the spread of the pandemic in order to carry out what is called as social management of the patients and suspected cases. Such usage of digital technology can help a government gain better control over the pandemic and China's strategy is being replicated and being followed by many countries around the world including India. See yesterday when we spoke about the geofencing app that is being used by India, we also discussed some of the concerns raised by it such as the data privacy of the individual. Similar concerns exist with regard to the usage of intrusive digital technologies driven by AI and in a post-COVID-19 world, we might very well witness the rise of digital authoritarianism. Now let's take up an article from page number 9. The lockdown is having a positive impact on the air quality of New Delhi. Over the last few days, the air quality index for New Delhi has jumped to the good category and data provided by the Central Pollution Control Board shows that Delhi's air quality index in the last week of March for 2020 has improved considerably as compared to the previous years. According to this data, there has been a 35-40% to 40 reduction in PM2.5 and PM10 levels mainly because of the restrictions on vehicles, industries and construction activities. These restrictions, especially the restriction on vehicles, has brought down the levels of oxides of nitrogen and carbon monoxide and this has contributed to a significant improvement in Delhi's air quality. A couple of months ago, we have discussed repeatedly how Delhi's air quality falls to the very severe category 
on the air quality index during the winter season that is between November to Jan. During the winter season, a number of factors contribute to high pollution including the practice of stubble burning in neighboring Punjab and Haryana and along with this heavy pollution caused by vehicles, industries and construction activities within the NCR region adds to the problem. But the problem gets aggravated primarily because the pollutants remain suspended in the atmosphere due to the lack of wind currents and as the pollutants start settling closer to the surface it results in the formation of thick smog. But by March the air quality in the NCR region starts improving because the beginning of summer brings in consistent winds which will flush out the air pollutants in the Indo-Gangetic plains. But this year the coinciding of the lockdown with this natural phenomena has drastically reduced the concentration of pollutants in the NCR region and it has led to a significant improvement in Delhi's air quality. Now let's take up the next article. The nationwide lockdown is having a negative impact on women. The National Commission for Women has noted a two-fold increase in cases of domestic violence during the lockdown period. As we discussed earlier, the imposition of lockdown has increased social isolation and resulted in loss of employment and this has placed greater mental stress on certain individuals which in turn contributes to increased stress within the household. So in a gender unequal society such as India, increased household stress and increased mental stress has directly resulted in a steep increase in violence against women. This alarming trend has been noted by the National Commission for Women which has seen a two-fold increase in the complaints received against domestic violence during the lockdown period. So in this context, let us talk about the role, mandate and the composition of the National Commission for Women. See, the National Commission for Women was established in 1992 as a statutory body under the National Commission for Women Act of 1990. Its primary mandate is to review the safeguards that have been provided in the constitution and in the legal system for the safety and empowerment of women. It is also responsible for recommending legislative amendments and new legislation in order to uphold the safety and well-being of women. It also has the responsibility to address the grievances of women in cases such as rape, dowry harassment, domestic violence, gender-based discrimination, lack of representation in politics, industry, etc. Apart from this, the National Commission for Women advises the government on all policy matters affecting the well-being of women. Now let us talk about the composition of the commission. The commission is headed by a chairperson who is nominated by the government of India and the person to be nominated should have a proven commitment to the cause of women. Apart from the chairperson, the commission consists of five members who are also nominated by the government of India. These members should be of renowned ability, integrity and standing and they should have considerable experience in the fields of law or legislation, trade unionism, women's voluntary organizations, administration, economic development, health, education or social welfare. And the day-to-day -day functioning of the commission is carried out by the member secretary who is also nominated by the government of India. The law mandates that the member secretary should be an expert in the field of management, organizational structure or sociological movement or should be an officer of the All India Services and hold a post under the union government. Then for the sake of prelims, please note down that the National Commission for Women publishes a monthly newsletter known as Rashtra Mahila. As per this mandate, the National Commission for Women enjoys the powers of a civil court. So this means that the commission can summon any person while investigating or examining a matter. The commission has the powers to review the constitutional and legal safeguards that have been guaranteed to women. It also receives complaints against cases in which women rights have been affected and it also takes su moto notice of such issues. After receiving such complaints, the commission can investigate and examine the matter and it will take up the matter with the concerned authorities. Then in order to ensure the well-being and socio-economic development of women, the National Commission takes part in the planning process 
in order to encourage the representation of women in all spheres such as politics industry etc then after examining the constitutional and legal safeguards the commission can recommend changes through amendments and new legislations which can be incorporated by the government the commission will also work with the central and the state authorities to ensure its effective implementation and enforcement then the commission also has the powers to carry out a legal intervention in order to secure justice for women especially in family matters for this purpose the commission has promoted alternate dispute resolution mechanisms such as the lok adalat it has come up with a initiative known as the parivarik mahila lok adalat which is a innovative tool that is based on the concept of nyay panchayats this alternate dispute resolution mechanism provides for speedy redressal and disposal of cases and it encourages cordial mutual settlement and the flexibility that it provides in implementation helps in securing swift justice to women now let's take up the next article which will help us understand the ongoing crisis in the global oil markets see major global oil indices such as brent crude west texas intermediate have crashed due to the impact of the covid-19 pandemic and due to the conflict between major oil producers such as russia and saudi arabia see the outbreak of the pandemic has resulted in a massive fall in demand for oil because economic activities around the world have come to a near standstill due to the imposition of lockdowns but even though the demand for oil was falling drastically the oil producing countries continued to produce the same quantity of oil and this led to a situation where we had weak demand and oversupply in the market and this naturally led to a massive fall in the prices of major global oil indices in order to resolve this crisis the cartel of oil producing countries known as opec plus met a couple of weeks ago and during this summit saudi arabia insisted that russia should cut its production in order to stabilize the oil prices but russia refused and as a result the deal fell apart as the deal fell apart oil prices crashed further leading to complete chaos in the global oil markets but this article refers to a possible deal that might emerge between russia and saudi arabia during the opec plus meet that is scheduled again for next week it is hoped that both the countries will arrive at a deal and agree to a mutually convenient reduction in global oil production because the united states has tried to act as a mediator between the two countries over the last one week president trump has spoken to leaders of both the countries and reportedly both russia and saudi arabia have agreed to a mutual reduction in oil production so this hope for a deal between russia and saudi arabia during the upcoming opec plus meet has pushed up global oil indices such as brent crude and west texas intermediate now let's take up the practice questions which of the following are considered as a non timber forest produce is it wild honey or tendu leaves or sal seeds bamboo or gum and resin the correct answer is option d all the five are considered as non timber forest produce this question has been asked because according to this article on page number 4 the tribal communities of odisha have not been able to sell the non timber forest produce that they have collected due to the lockdown see non timber forest produce falls under the definition of minor forest produce as defined under the forest rights act of 2006 according to this act minor forest produce consists of non timber forest produce such as bamboo brushwood stumps canes tussar cocoon honey waxes lac tendu leaves medicinal plants herbs roots and tuber now let's take up the second practice question which organization is responsible for handling the country's power management functions through the national load dispatch center the correct answer is option c it is the power system operation corporation limited this question has been asked because of this article on page number 8 see as we all know the prime minister has called upon the citizens to switch off all lights and light lamps or candles on the 5th of april at 9 pm in order to build a collective spirit amongst the citizens during these tough times but this sudden announcement of the prime minister has taken the power ministry 
and the power distribution agencies by complete surprise. Their concern is that if millions of citizens around the country stop consuming electricity at once, there could be a sudden fall in load which in turn could cause failure of power grids. See, failure of a power grid is not like your regular electricity cut. Power grids are a part of a country's critical infrastructure. If a power grid fails, it could take days or maybe even weeks to bring it back online. So the Power Grid Corporation of India Limited, which is responsible for managing the power grids and its subsidiary, the Power System Operation Corporation Limited, which runs the National Load Dispatch Center, have started to take adequate precautions. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? The National Securities Depository Limited or NSDL handles most of the securities held and settled in dematerialized form or DMAT form in the Indian capital market. The enactment of the SEBI Act in 1992 paved way for the establishment of NSDL. RBI issued license to NSDL to operate as a payment bank in India to carry out payment transactions. NSDL is owned by the RBI and Ministry of Finance. Amongst the given statements, the second and the fourth statements are incorrect. So option B is the right answer. See, NSDL was established in 1996 through the Depositories Act and it is owned by a number of stakeholders led by IDBI, Unit Trust of India, the National Stock Exchange and a number of other banks. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 15, foreign portfolio investors have sold more than 1 lakh crore securities in just one month and this is the first time in the history of Indian capital markets that there has been such a large outflow of capital. This massive outflow of capital has been triggered by concerns surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic and this data has been provided by the National Securities Depository Limited. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2016 prelims paper. With reference to Stand Up India scheme, which of the following statements are correct? Its purpose is to promote entrepreneurship amongst SC, ST and women entrepreneurs. It provides for refinance through SIDBI. Both the statements are correct. Option C is the right answer. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, in a post-COVID-19 world, we will witness significant changes in the global order. Discuss. The second question, examine the role, mandate and composition of National Commission for Women. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post them in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.